<laughs> Very good. <laughs> that is really <laughs> dog in box. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> Hello champions, thank you for joining me again for our next and final lesson in the probability topic. Here is your riddle to get your brain started. If you think you know what this is, let me know in the comments and the first correct answer gets pinned. All right, so for today, I wanted to look at a bit of a different lesson for today. We're just gonna look at three uh, interesting probability problems. So these are three uh, applications of probability in real life that I find interesting and I'm hoping you do too. Here's our first one. Okay, back in the 60s and 70s on Australian TV, there was this uh, weird game show called Let's Make a Deal, and it was hosted by this guy called uh, Monty Hall. So this is often referred to as the Monty Hall problem. Here's the setup, okay? We have a contestant on the show, and they are to pick from three doors. Now, here is the deal. Behind one of these doors is going to be, uh, let's say, a million dollars in cash. And behind the other two are goats, which are relatively worthless, okay? So right now, I want you to pick a door for me, okay? Pick door uh, one, two, or three. Okay, you have picked door one, and for a third of the people watching, you're thinking I'm a psychic, but I just picked one at random as well. Now, I'm choosing door one, door A, whatever you wanna call it, but here is where it gets interesting. Now the host, Mr. Monty Hall, is going to reveal that behind the second door is a goat. Okay, so there is no uh, bag with a million dollars in it behind door number two. And here's where it gets interesting. Now the host says to you, all right, uh, viewer, do you want to stick with your original door, door number one, or do you want to swap and instead go with the third door? Are you going to stick with what you picked originally, or are you going to swap to the remaining door? Think about what, what you would do. Would you stick with your original guess or would you jump ship and go to the new one? All right, now here's what's interesting. Most people on the show would stick with their door because they had a good feeling about it. You know, it's the door they started off with and they just want to stick with it. But here's the thing. If you swap, you are more likely to win the money. In fact, you double your chances of winning. And in this case, you should have because door number one has a goat and door number three has the uh, small bag with a million dollars in it. So if you said swap, you are correct. And I'm going to explain why now. So when you first had your choice and you chose door number one, you could have chose any of the three doors and the probability that you pick the door with the money behind it would be one in three. Okay, there's three options. You're picking completely at random. It is a one in three chance. So the door that I picked, door number one, has a one in three chance of having the money, which means that doors two and three have a two out of three chance, okay? There's a one in three chance it's here, and there's a two in three chance it's not here, okay? Now over here, I'm telling you that door number two is not an option, okay? Because there is a goat behind it, so you wouldn't wanna pick that unless you really love goats for whatever reason. And so now the two in three probability must be just on this door here, okay? Because there's a one in three that it's in your door, so there's a two in three chance that it's not in your door, which means it's gotta be over here. Okay, so what we saw on the TV show all those years ago is that if the contestant chose to swap doors, they were twice as likely to win the money, and so you should always swap. And there you go, that's called the Monty Hall problem. All right, and for our next application of probability, I am going to teach you my guaranteed winning strategy for Monopoly, okay? I have never played a game of Monopoly where I used a strategy and I didn't win. It's that simple, okay? Now, this strategy uh, involves buying the best property, okay? I know everyone's got their favorite color, but there is one set of properties in Monopoly that if you buy, you are mathematically more likely to win, and I'll explain why. So to understand this, we need to understand the outcomes of a dice roll in Monopoly, okay? Those who have played a fair bit know that the game is played with two dice, okay? You roll the two dice, and you move the number of spaces. So the, the worst you can possibly roll is you can get a one and a one, which gives you a two. The best you can get to cover the most distance is a six and a six, which gets you a 12. So for our possible rolls, we have a bunch of outcomes. We have from, from two to 12, but let's let's think about this as the first dice has six, six options 
and the second dice has the six options as well. So in total, we are going to have 36 outcomes. Let's fill in this, uh, this, this outcome table here and look at the range of outcomes. So we have a two and a one makes three, a three and a two makes five, so on and so forth. Now, what you can see here is that there's only one two, there's only one 12, and the closer you get to seven, the more possible ways you can make it, okay? If you're trying to make a three, there's only two ways you can do that. You can get one and two, or you can get two and one. If you're trying to make a seven, there is one, two, three, four, five, six ways you can do that. You can do a six and a one, a five and a two, yeah, so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is, of our 36 outcomes, only one of them is a two, only one of them is a 12, but six of them are a seven, and five of them are a six, and five of them are an eight. So the closer you get to seven, the more likely you are to roll that number. Okay, and that is the key to this strategy. So just keep in your mind that the most likely outcome is seven, but six and eight are also very likely. Okay, let's look at our board again. So we have 10 squares on each row, so we have 40 squares in total. Now, if there's 40 squares, on average, you would expect to land on any given square, it would be a one in 40 chance, okay? On average, once you've done a few laps, roughly about a one in, one in 40 chance. Except there is one square where you are bound to end up at some point, you know what it is? It is this one down here, jail, okay? You can land on this just by normally if you're passing by and you land on it. If you land on this square up here, you go to jail for three turns. Uh, most people play if you roll doubles three times in a row, it's called speeding and you go to jail. And also there are community chests and chance cards which can also send you to jail. So I would say out of all these squares, the one where you are definitely most likely to be is jail. So if you're most likely to be on this square and then eventually you'll be just visiting and it's your turn to roll again, if you're on this square, where are you most likely to end up? Well, chances that you roll a two are very slim, so you're probably not gonna be here. The chances you roll a 12 are very slim, so probably not here. You are more likely to end up on six, seven, and eight. So if we're starting here, we are probably, if we're lucky, we'll get the community chest, but if we're unlucky, we're gonna hit the orange territory, and that is why I do whatever is necessary. I bargain, I beg, I steal, I do whatever I can to get these orange properties. And then once you've got all three, it's basically chess, mate, okay? That, that is the game. You can basically pack up the board and you've won because everyone is gonna land on jail and then everyone's gonna land on your sweet hotels, okay? That is the zone. I guarantee you buy these three, you are going to make sweet bank, you are going to bankrupt your friends, you're gonna have a great time and that is a McGrath guarantee, okay? That is my strategy, please use it wisely. Okay, and for our last application of probability today, we are going to look at a story of how probability was once uh, used to actually save lives in World War II. This story is completely true, and if you don't believe me, I encourage you to Google it because it is super interesting. Okay, so in World War II, the Allied forces had a major problem on their hands. Their problem was that uh, far too many of their fighter planes were being shot down, and they were losing too many men, suffering too many losses, okay? Here's what they did, they inspected all the fighter planes that were returning safely from battle with their pilots still alive, and they could see that most of their damage on their fighter planes was happening in these areas shown here in red. Okay, so these spots are where the planes are copying most of the damage. All right, now the thing with fighter planes is you need to try and keep them light so they fly quickly and fly at all, okay? So we can't be putting too much armor on this plane because then suddenly, it's not gonna fly as quick and you're gonna suffer even more losses. So the Allies made the logical decision to put a little bit more armor on their planes in these red spots. Their logic was, well, these are the places where we're seeing the most damage. So if we help cover these, then uh, we should be seeing fewer losses, okay? So they did this, they added more armor. And then what they saw was that they hadn't really had an effect. They were still losing quite a lot of fighter pilots and they hadn't really solved the problem. So they were really confused. And so what do you do when you're confused? You ask the smart kid. So the allies uh, went and asked uh, a statistician, a master of probability, his name was Abraham Wald. And they said to him, they said, brah, why isn't the extra army helping our planes? Why are we still seeing uh, mass amounts of losses? Why isn't this helping? And his response was probably something like, uh, you fools, you are approaching this problem in a completely wrong way. 
What do you think he's talking about? Why is putting extra armor on these areas not going to help? I'll let you have a think about what you would do, what your advice to allies would be. Okay, so the problem here is that the allies were falling for this uh, phenomenon that's known as survivorship bias. Okay, and by this I mean they're only thinking about the planes which return home safely. They're only thinking about the successful trials in terms of this probability experiment of sending a plane out. They're only looking at the successes. They're not thinking about the failures. Okay, so if they were flipping coins, they're only recording heads. They're not worrying about tails. Okay, think about it. If, if this is the data that they've analyzed from the returning uh, planes, these are the planes that, are, that have survived. Okay, so what this data is showing you is that the red spots are where your fighter plane can take some damage, but still keep flying and return home safely. So really the areas you should be worried about are the ones where you aren't seeing damage in the white areas here, because these are the areas where the damage is fatal because the plane is crashing. So really, if you're gonna add uh, armor to this ship, the best place to do it is the white areas where you aren't seeing damage from the returning ships, okay? Don't just look at your successful trials. Also think about your failures so you see the entire picture. Okay, so they did this and it worked, okay? They actually saw fewer uh, damaged or ruined planes by putting armor in the white sections. So there you go, probability can save lives. There is uh, a point to what I'm teaching you. And yeah, now you know that, maybe you can go out and save some lives yourselves. Okay, thanks so much for watching. I hope you found any of that interesting. If you did find any of it interesting, feel free to hit that like button. And if you want to see more interesting things in the future, uh, you can consider subscribing. But uh, that's all for me today. So thanks very much. And I'll see you in the next video.